it's getting to the business end of the season. And at the mountain, these guys really meant business. Oh, oh. great right into the wall. Hard into the wall. Oh, championship leader goes spearing off with the chase. Oh, no, don't do it, oh. don't do it. Now a former Rookie of the Year looks on track to take his first series crown. But all that can change in a blink of an eye in Surface Paradise. Oh, massive! Oh, huge crash. The whole track has been blocked. This is round seven of the V8 U Series, fueled by Hogsmeath Cafe. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the streets of the Gold Coast. It's the penultimate round today, the 2014 V8 Ute Series. Now, last time out at Bathurst, Reese McNally won for Holden. That doesn't really sound like an amazing achievement because Holden's been all the time. Wrong. They haven't won around until then in 2014. Such has been the domination of Ford in this category. It's a Ford driver, Chris Walton, who's kicked clear in the championship. Just two rounds left to go. The Gold Coast and Sydney Olympic Park. What do those two have in common? Concrete and lots of it. When it bites, it bites really hard. And we saw that here in 2013. V8 Ute Racing fans could barely forget the carnage that involved several drivers, including championship contender David Cedars on the Gold Coast last year. Oh, massive! Oh, huge crash. Huge impact. Oh, that's a scary, scary wreck in the chicane. Cam Wilson was also caught up in the accident. His car was written off, and it's been an uphill battle since. So I was doing about 140 k's an hour. Uh, I, I just got off the throttle and bang, I was in there. So. I had a, a split second to blink and thought this is going to hurt and I was very happy to sort of open my eyes the other side about a second later and realise for the most part that I was intact. Oh, you, this is how it's going to happen. Hold on! Oh. Oh. That gives a sense shivers down your spine. I felt that, Billy. That seemed to be really sort of the start of some bad run. We built another new car that we went to Adelaide with and it was very fast. I was sort of top five on pace there and had that crash in qualifying and destroyed a totally brand new car. David Cedars was penalised for causing the multi-car crash here last year and will be desperately hoping he can keep out of trouble and challenge championship leader Chris Walton for this year's title. He was on the receiving end of trouble courtesy of Ryle Harris at the last round of Bathurst which robbed him of valuable championship points. It was like my car had this big target sign on it, come please hit me. <laughs> uh, but uh, un unfortunately it, it wasn't, wasn't the greatest weekend for us in Results terms uh, getting turned around three out of three races. Is he going to gather it up? Contact with Cedars. The second time those two have been each other today. Unfortunately, David's making it hard for me, which he's entitled to do. And you know, I should have been a little bit more patient and waited a few more corners, and we probably would have avoided that, and we probably would have ended up on the podium. So, an error on my behalf in the first admit that. But you know, we're looking forward. Home track here on the Gold Coast. I love it here. Black record from last year family and friends are here, got some great local sponsors and, um, you know, really keen to get a good result for them. Reese McNally has hit form at the right time of the year, collecting his first round win at Bathurst, putting him fifth in the title fight and hungry for more race wins. Yeah, I absolutely love Gold Coast. It's probably my favourite track on the calendar, so I'm uh, not afraid to use a lot of curve, not afraid to bounce off the walls, so it's definitely a uh, quite an intimidating track, but, you know, I'll grab it with uh, both hands and see what we can do. Third in the championship, Nathan Pretty won the round last year and knows what it takes to put fast laps together on this punishing street circuit. It's just really how much curb you can get away with without breaking the car. The curbs are quite high here uh, and if you don't monster them and throw the car over them and all the rest of it, then you'll be nowhere in times. And it just goes to show that first session there, I was going around the curbs and I'm P nowhere. really need to lift my game a little bit and just start monstering them, just throwing the car over them. Also making a late charge for a top three finish in the championship is Jesse Dixon, who trails pretty by just three points in fourth. But before anyone can lay claim to championship podium aspirations, they must first steer clear of the concrete walls that have a history of bringing even the most experienced drivers undone. To the armour all point score and Chris Walton is in the box seat, isn't he? Seat is falling away off the pace at Bathurst. Really just needs to make sure, Chris Walton, that he stays out of trouble, stays off the concrete walls and he'll have a handy lead going to the last round over in Homebush. Speaking of armour all, the pole position winner for the first time in his young career, Jesse Dixon taking $1,000. It's also the first pole position this season so far for the Holdens. Yes, Jesse, it's real. Congratulations in his former hometown as well as we get ready to unleash the Utes over the kerbs and through the concrete we go. This is surface paradise. 
and it's the penultimate round of the championship. The V8 Utes, fueled by Hogs Breath Cafe. The racing's coming up. This round, we profile a driver and team owner who's had his share of spectacular crashes over the years, Peter Burnett. Yeah, how I got the V8 Ute racing was my son-in-law at the time. He was looking at racing. He first sponsored a car and then we went out and did our cams licence together and uh, I got behind the wheel of the Ute at one of the practice days and thought, Dude, this is pretty good. And uh, seven years later, I'm still here and enjoying it. I've had a bit of bad luck with the Ute racing over the years. I had a roll over at Darwin, which uh, made play of, the, play of the week actually on TV, so that was pretty pretty funny. But um, And also I had a pretty big uh, hit up here at the coast about four, four years ago where I actually got up and uh, I had to wait for the ambulance guy to come around the medic. And while I was waiting, the crowd was sort of pretty happy about it. So I took a bow on the back of the ute and sort of brought the house down. So I thought to myself, I couldn't do better, any better than that. So last race and big crash. So they were all cheering. So that was it. <laughs> Great championship picture unfolding on the streets of Surface Paradise. A big hello to Alex Davison, who's along for the ride. Alex, this track is very bruising. Very bruising. We saw all weekend across all categories the damage done to the cars by overusing the kerbs. <laughs> We've seen these guys are stuck into it in practice before the racing's even started. This was during the Friday practice session, and it's Jeremy Gray going around and stacks on Elliot Barber in the Just Car Insurance Ute. Now, we actually slipped on coolant, and what a place to get stuck. And Elliot's done a great job avoiding the accident, but then everyone else has piled into the back <laughs> of him. It doesn't look like he's had too much damage, but not what you want before the racing even starts. Yeah, so the big news out of that one is look at Roel Harris. A lot of damage to the right front of that car. Phil Woodbury was involved in that one as well. Cam Wilson just avoided it. But there'll be more drama for Cam Wilson in race number one. These are the highlights of the first race of the weekend. And it was Jesse Dixon who was the pole sitter leading us down to turn one. But here we go, hard on the brakes. And poor Jerry McLeod spun around down there at turn four. Kim Jane, big lunge up the inside there. I think he also had somebody hitting him in the rear. So it was a disaster all in all. Elliot Barber was just in behind Kim this Jane. This looks bad as well. Yeah, so this was the replay riding aboard Jane. He's got Jerry McLeod to his outside. And that's a brand new, well, essentially brand new. They've rebuilt it from scratch after Whoa. the crashes. Up the inside goes Jane. Kim committed from a long way back there and don't know if he had help at all, but it was never really on, so. This is the battle for the lead. How a go, have a go at Roll Harris. Around the outside at turn 11, he gets stuck on the outside for turn 12, doesn't even think of backing down. A couple of Gold Coast boys going at it. But how good's that? They're racing hard. I mean, to stay around the outside on some of those corners, it's slippery offline, it's very narrow, he's very brave, but they made it stick, didn't get into each other, so that's great racing. Big crash, this one. Ben Wilson, hard into the fence, bang! Phil Woodbury, nowhere to go. And Cam Wilson, third big crash in a year. He was involved in that monster accident here last year. Talk us through this one. Ben Wilson, a bit shallow on the first kerb and then the big understeer into the fence. Yeah, just committed to the chicane a little bit too much, clipped that tyre bundle, too much speed, and then couldn't get through the, the turn two part of the chicane. Wasn't Jerry uh, Gray very lucky to avoid that one? Yeah, he was very oh. lucky. Unfortunately, the next driver wasn't so lucky, and we've seen a huge accident. So that's uh, lucky they all walked away there, because that's a massive impact, which we're about to see. Makes you cringe, oh. cringe. Head on, and the helmet lurching forward for Phil Woodbury and then Cam Wilson sees all of this unfolding and he thinks the tyres to the left are going to be the better option. He went head first into the tyre fence in the back of the go-karts, Ute bouncing around and uh, that was enough to bring out the safety car. Five race wins on this street circuit coming into the weekend, make that six for Ryle Harris and whoever wins race one in the weekend so far this year has also won race three so he might pick up a couple of wins and the round win if he can keep that form going. Jesse Dixon doing a good job stay out of trouble and keep that thing in second. There's the famous chicane along the back of this circuit. This is the reverse grid race. Alex, we're going to flip the top 11 for this one, so Roel Harris will have to start off the sixth row. And this place is very difficult to pass. It also means that we've got an all-seaters racing front row between Gray and Fisher. And our championship combatants a long way back down in uh, rows three and four, so that's going to be interesting to watch from there. Oh, I love these reverse grid races or reverse top 11 races and uh, couldn't get a more treacherous circuit to do one of these events than the Gold Coast Street Circuit. So it's going to be plenty of action here with the fast guys trying to come through the field. So unfortunately, no Phil Woodbury, no Terry Nightingale. The Bathurst boy has too much damage. He was also caught up in a race one accident. So he's a goner for the next two races. Fast guys off the back, including Jared McLeod and Kim Jane. 
So there's a fair bit to watch here. Jeremy Gray started on the front row at Sandown and was very close to taking a race two win in the reverse group race at Sandown. Could this be the time? The staggered start could be the advantage. They actually dropped the Australian flag for the beginning of race one. A bit old school retro stuff, but it's back with a good old fashioned red light. Gray slow to jump. Good start, pretty. He wants the middle. He's not going to find it. I think he ran into the back of Jeremy Gray. Great start by Andrew Fisher, but even better start by Nathan Pretty. But he had nowhere to go. Ended up having to lift, and he's lost positions in the end. But they're pulling oh. their way through. No. It's tight down there, and a few guys decide to jump the chicane. You're riding on board with Adam Marjorie. McNally picked up one or two spots as a result of the chaos down there in turn one. How they all got through oh. that first chicane, I've got no idea, because there was plenty of contact. But luckily, uh, everyone used their head and cut the chicane and avoided the trouble. So, fingers crossed. So far, everyone's facing the right direction. So far, so good. Bit of bump and grind back there, and Bazadzik's already lost the new one. Bubba, oh. oh, big tank slapper, Peter Burnett. We've seen him have some big ones here before, and that was nearly another one, but he makes it to the beach chicane in one piece, and the long snake of Utes goes bouncing through the curves. There goes the battery world forward of Spud Wood for the first time in Spud's career. He's out there in a Ford, and it's a Ford that's leading the way right now with Jeremy Gray. Bouncing their way through the back chicane was definitely the right term to use there. Uh, <laughs> springing and bouncing and pulling air, and we've got Harris again on the outside now. These guys got together at Bathurst. Cedars wants to be careful. He's in a championship battle right now, and once again, Harris forcing his way around the outside. Speedway style, just stick it to the top and get the move made. That's hard to do, and he's very brave doing it, but pulled it off cleanly, did a great job. That's awesome. Exciting to watch. So, entertaining first lap. Adam Marjoram, the West Aussie, is in behind the Wake Up ICU of George Meadeke, who's on the Bathurst podium at the last round. Meadeke with a, just a stab of the brakes, brings that brake pressure back up down at turn one. And Gray, your leader. The Stratco Ute just stalking him back there in second, but wonder if the officials are going to look at that turn one chicane because there's a fair bit of chaos going down there with guys taking some unusual lines. Yeah, Reese McNally with some damage to his front bumper there as well. But, I mean, the, the stewards generally look at the, for the cutting the first chicane on the first lap that if you cut it to avoid an accident and don't gain an advantage, don't overtake anyone or anything, they'll turn a blind eye. Um, but if you just overtake someone blatantly, you're not going to get away with it. So they'll have to look at a few replays there, I think. Yeah, Nathan Pretty has been passed by about four or five cars here down the back of the beach straights. You can see his car crab walking down oh, the straight. Oh, Harris! Harris up the inside there as well. He's, a, oh. he's taking his brave pills today. Ryle has. He's doing really well amazing. carving he through the field. Up the inside of Hansford and Pretty. And look at poor Nathan Pretty, the winner of this event last year without winning a race, mind you. is not going to be winning it this time, is he? He's going backwards in a big race, and he's got Rowan Barry up behind him now, and I think he might be coming into the pits. Yeah, I'd say he'd come in. I, I reckon he's probably got a puncture or suspension damage, but you can see the car crab walking down the straight, so he's out of contention in this race. But this is the tough part, because he wants to make it over to the left to make yeah. a pit entry. It's like being on a highway when you know your exit's Ooh. coming up. Oh, it was tight. And Wayne Wakefield just gets out the way. That was horrible to watch. Glad he got in there, because that could have been nasty. Here's Dontis, who missed qualifying, missed the police escort to the track because the Utes are positioned a bit down the road. And he's just going around Wakefield. Bit of tappy tap. They're going to sort it out before they get down to turn one. Wakefield takes the Mario Kart exit and loses a spot to Pizadzic. There you go. So he cut the chicane. Definitely didn't get, didn't get an advantage there. Oh, and he cops one from Spud Wood. Here's the Yokohama replay at this start. Let's see if we can figure out what happened. Great Someone stalled pretty. down the back of the grid too, so they're all yeah, that was lucky Lee to Nicolau. get around that. Lee Nicolau, who uh, was going nowhere. Actually, this will give us a great view of that, Alex. Good spot. Kim Jane, and watch for the red ute. That will more than likely appear out of nowhere. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> oh, that was close. That was very close and lucky. All right. Alex, give us the lowdown here. Well, oh. there was too much action for me to be able to call through there. They were all lunging for the same gap, but somehow all got through unscathed. Plenty of contact. And here's and the tank slapper again. Peter Burnett having Jeez. a massive tank slapper. He's done a great job hanging on to that, because that would be up around 200 kilometres an hour through there for sure. And Oh, here we go. Change for the lead. This must have just happened. A replay of Reese McNally. Big lunge up the inside into turn 11. Here the tyres right on the edge of the oh. <laughs> And McNally is trying to open up a gap in spectacular fashion. We're going to go off to a quick ad break. Stick with us. Race two, V8 Utes, fueled by Hogs Breath Cafe. Welcome back to Surface Paradise, where the race leader 
is Reese McNally. And check this out on the Yokohama replay. Alex pushing very hard right now and lucky to get away with this one. No room left there. Awkward double bounce, taking a bit too much curb. So easy to throw it away around here. All replay action. This is on board with Elliot Barber now. Now, he's got Wayne Wakefield ahead of him. Bit of a dive bomb down at 11. Dive bomb, but he's only half committed and stuck his nose in straight into the back of... <laughs> That was Wayne Wakefield. Wayne Wakefield. They both got away with it. He's giving it away. Sorry, mate. My bad, my bad. Here it is from the outside view. It's oh. one, of those, one of those spots where you either got to commit completely completely, or stay behind. Now we're on board with the Wanda Paints on board of Peter Burnett. And he's got someone on the outside of him, mate. Yeah, Kim Jane. Oh, Kim Jane. Oh, that's a brave spot to go around the outside. Very brave. Very brave. Especially when you consider there's always a bit of action around Peter Burnett, but they both got <laughs> through there really well. Kimmy looks like he's on a charge. Jane's off to enjoy the battle ahead of him down at turn 11. Smoke and brakes oh. locking up. And another up the inside. And that's actually Spud Wood in the battery world forward. Oh! And that's McLeod into the back of the Just Car Insurance. Oh, this would be good. These two oh, do not like awkward. each other. And they're on. That, turn 13, contact. That move is never going to happen. It's always going to end messily. And now we've got Kim Jane having a look as well at Jared McLeod. Now that was... Jared McLeod sending a bit of a message there to the back of Elliot Bar, but these two got together in the reverse grip race when we're running in sand down. It was McLeod who lost out that time, and he'd love to catch up to the back tailgate of this Ute once again. Halfway home in race two. What do you think the message was that he sent him? Oh, I'm coming for you, <laughs> buddy. I'm coming. Stay out of my way, or well, you could be in the tyre fence at some point in the next half of this race. But he's got more problems right now because Kim Jane is going to make his life quite difficult. We're all locking brakes down at turn four once again. No ABS on these V8 utes, but still a boosted brake system. So all the, the, the job is completely up to the driver to oh. control that brake locking. And they're very sensitive, easy to lock up a wheel. It's not like uh, the V8 supercars that you're used to driving where you just stamp the brakes. These things are very different. You use the yeah, engine braking with the, uh, the gear shifts as well. Yeah, using plenty of curb, these guys. <laughs> There's no great. tie bundles for the Utes. Like the V8s have got big tie bundles there to try and stop us using quite as much curb. Nothing like that for the Utes. We want to see them flying on two wheels and double <laughs> bouncing, and luckily they're built strong. It's just how much you want to be brave. Oh, McLeod's brave. It's getting right out to the exit of turns 11, 12 now is another left-hander. That Ute has had a full rebuild. Phil Mundy and the Repair Management Australia crew dropped everything to get that Ute fixed after Bathurst. And Jared McLeod, we can see him pushing really hard. He had the right front locked into turn 12, trying to fight these guys in front of him. But uh, so bumpy under brakes here. You're constantly on the limit while you're braking for the corners. And if you don't quite get one of those wheels unlocked, it won't turn in. And then it gets ugly. We've got a few Porsche drivers doing double duty with V8 supercars. Jared's doing double duty in V8 supercars as well. But as a tyre changer for Russell Ingle and Tim Blanchard at Lucas Dumbrell Motorsport, as we go back into the kerbs, down at turn one, he's doing a good job keeping someone as experienced as Kim Jane behind him at the moment. Kim trying to get a good run through the turn one, two, three chicane to then look at passing into turn four. But it's Jared McLeod looking to pass into turn four. This is a great battle, so evenly matched. Kim trying to get the over and under there and he's got a run on Jared McLeod out of turn four, side by side, up the back straight, through <laughs> this set of S's here, approaching the back chicane where we've seen so oh. many big accidents over the years with cars trying to go through here side by side, but Kim has the line. So is that part of the rules? You just gotta yield in that situation if you're on the outside? No, the rule is just whoever blinks first and hope for the best, <laughs> I think, in V8Us. Here we go. This is the battle for fifth right now, and Dixon's got his hands full, hasn't he? Because he's got the all-purpose pest control ute once again. Right behind him, Roel Harris, who's been buoyed after making the switch to Matt Stone Racing and your championship leader. Make that championship leaders are in behind them as well. Cedars needs to pass him, guys. He needs to get some points back on the guy who's ahead of him. And you can see that Holden power. Jesse Dixon pulling out of that last corner and getting a couple of car lengths. Lead down the straight there, right on the limit under brakes. Oh, and Royal Harris are boarding. He's done the right thing, though. We've seen what happens when you commit into that turn one, two, three chicane too fast. There's nowhere to go. Oh, Cedars right up behind the Renko tailgate, filling the mirrors of Chris Killawalt and your championship leader comfortably with one round to play at the end of this one. All he needs to do is stay exactly where he is. He doesn't need to turn back the uh, Chris Killer Walton of old and start knocking people out the way. He's been driving a very conservative approach for the last few rounds. Yeah, but there's uh, 
you know, too many races left and all on street circuits to back off now in terms of the championship fight. He's got to keep pushing. Not again, surely. Harris round the outside again. He loves oh. that outside move. And there's a slow car in his way. Who was that? That was Meadiki. So something's happened to Slick Meadiki down there at turn 11. And uh, Harris trying the same move that worked in race one, but the tracks actually started to deteriorate a little bit through turn 11, and I think that caught him out a lot of understeer. Yeah, he wouldn't have been expecting uh, George oh. Meadiki. Oh, so he's hit the tyres, got it out, and just got moving when Ryle Harris has arrived there around the outside, fully committed, oh. struggling to make it around the corner anyway. So hairy moment there for Ryle. They've all done it. Whoa, oh, there it is. He just got caught up with that. That deck's happening. Just lock the inside front wheel, wheel right at the last minute. Yeah, here's an interesting battle because our race leader is driving like a man possessed at the moment. He's worried, I think, about getting pinged, maybe a five-second penalty for what happened on that first lap. But this is the final lap. It's actually a Cedars 1-2-3 right now, but not with the man that they want to have inside the top three. The rest of his teammates putting on a great show. It's McNally leading from Fisher, Jeremy Gray, and Adam Mardrum having a fantastic weekend so far in the Auto 1 Ute. He's been fighting inside the top five all weekend long, despite having gearbox problems in qualifying. Yeah, no, he's had a great race, and he's getting right up behind... Jeremy Gray. Jeremy Gray there. He'll be hoping to make up another spot on the last lap, but very difficult to do on this final sector of the circuit. So unless something major happens, they're still pressing on very hard, but unless something majorly disastrous happens here, there's going to be no changes of position, I don't think. Well, it might not be disastrous, but we are hearing that there could be a five-second and will be a five-second penalty handed out to Reese McNally. So he's first to the finish line like he was in 2010 in the reverse grid race. But Fisher is just, and I mean just, inside the five seconds. 4.3 second gap, so Fisher will be awarded the win. He's first since he's on the streets of Adelaide in 2013, so it's been a long drought. Andrew Fisher, Reese McNally on our graphics will be first home, but 4.3 seconds, so close. McNally, as a result, will slot into second position. Either way, it's a Cedars 1-2-3. We're going to have a look at a bit of a replay of the Term 1 incident where Reese McNally cut the chicane. Here we go, they're all funneling into the first chicane. Reese McNally overtaking Andrew Fisher by cutting the circuit. It's a clear-cut penalty in the end. Well, Reese, unlucky in that race uh, to, to be robbed of that. You, you knew you'd done the wrong thing, did you? Yeah, I mean, I got hit pretty hard at the start and pushed straight through and sort of a half readdressed it. I didn't really completely readdress it, so I thought something would come of it. So um, I tried to get a five-second gap on uh, Fisher, but unfortunately, I think we were tenth and a half uh, too slow. So a bit unfortunate, but, you know, that's racing. Andrew, any time you can get a win on this track, things are going well for you. Yeah, fantastic for us. Always good to win on a Sunday as well for us. And, uh, yeah, well, uh, we've been searching all year for a win. We haven't had one yet. And uh, so it was great to actually find one. And, uh, yeah, we'll take it. It was a great way to celebrate this uh, the stove. And you nearly didn't have it, but the penalty was applied. Yeah, look, I knew that Reese had um, shot the chicane early in the race, and uh, I was on the radio, the guys telling me, yeah, make sure I'm within five seconds of him, and uh, yeah, I came on the radio at the end, and they said, yep, you're inside it, and so uh, I was pretty sure we'd get the race win, but uh, it was always good to get the check of flag first, but at the end of the day, uh, the race wins what counts. We, uh, we get the sticker for the car, so uh, uh, another win for uh, for Cedars Racing and Jesus Racing, and uh, a one, two, three for the whole Cedars Racing team, so uh, a great result. So a bit of controversy and a bit of drama, and it's not over yet. We still have one more race on the streets of Surface Paradise. Disc Brakes Australia have proven they're up for a challenge as the official brake supplier to the V8 Ute Racing Series since its inception in 2001. With 1.8 tonne vehicles and the speeds they get up to now are 10 seconds quicker uh, since 2008 around the track so we've had to adopt to that style uh, the more aggressive racing uh, the uh, higher performance engines and come up with over the journey different brake systems to suit these beasts dba are considered innovators with painted designs including a kangaroo paw internal design that allows greater airflow a t3 slot design allowing more consistent and even braking through the surface of the pad and high temperature heat paint to monitor variations Nowhere does the DBA brake package get a harder workout than at the streets of the Gold Coast. This is probably one of the hardest braking tracks on the uh, calendar and certainly um, if you look at our product and, and the value adds that we, uh, the product comes with, uh, they can expect temperatures up to 800 degrees C this weekend down you know, from anywhere from 200 cycling through to 800 degrees C during the race. 
For more info, head to the V8 Utes website. Time for the final race of the weekend. It is the streets of Surface Paradise with all the curbs and concrete, the crowds, the balconies, a fantastic place to race. Harrison Dixon will be off the front row together, but that championship battle continues right now. Cedars row three, Walton row four. And you'd have to say, Alex, that, well, Cedars need something of a miracle this late in the season from here. Definitely, but you can never count anybody out. And Chris Walton is, you know, relatively deep in the pack in seventh where anything can happen. Look at last year, for example. <laughs> Absolutely. So David Cedars has just got to keep pushing, trying to get a race win, trying to get the best result possible. We've got Royal Harris and Jesse Dixon out in front who are out of the championship fight but just wanting to fight for bragging rights, basically, and wanting to get a race win. So it should be a great race. Royal Harris has just had so much speed since making that switch to Matt Stone Racing. Final race of the weekend. We're all set, ready on the Gold Coast. And oh, Harris, aggressive F1 style start. It doesn't work. Dixon finds the narrowest of margins to sneak his way into the lead of the race. Nice start, Jesse Dixon. Good start, Jesse Dixon. I don't know Ryle, why Ryle Harris pulled it so aggressively to the right, because it really slowed him up and he lost traction because of it. So Jesse Dixon, good job out in front, even though he got squeezed to the wall. That's going to be a close fight between those two guys, I'm sure, anyway. Down towards the turn four, hairpin, and everyone's giving each other a little bit of room. Elliot Barber on the outside, his teammate Nathan Pretty. And also Dantas, the Murphy Motorsport guys, a long way back in the pack. Not an ideal weekend for those guys. And we've got Chris Walton, also deep in the pack, not where he'll want to be. He'll want to be staying out of trouble. I'm sure he'd love to be out in front in clean air, away from uh, where anyone can crash into him. This is the moment. This is the place. Lap one, race three, where it all went horribly wrong last time. But they get through. There he comes, Harris. Harris st sticks his oh. nose in Jesse Dixon, giving him a car with, luckily, to stop getting turned around. And... Uh, Big op opportunistic move there. Luckily for Ryle, Jesse gave him plenty of room there because he didn't quite have his whole car in. He's not taking prisoners this weekend, is he, Ryle Harris? This time he was up the inside. He's already pulled off a few moves around the outside at Turn 11, so new leader, Gold Coast Zone, Ryle Harris. He's really got nothing to lose, so I suppose it's the right mindset to have going into this weekend. He's just got to go and try and get a race win. He's not really in championship contention anymore. That was also for the round win, essentially, as well. That puts him one point up wow. on Jesse Dixon for the overall round win. To step on the big podium at Surface Paradise is always an achievement as we go back on board with the menace, the West Aussie. He's trying to get a clean run over this turn one, two, three chicane, and he's got a run on Reese McNally there. He blocks down the outside. Let's check out how this start all unfolded. Yokohama <laughs> replay, Royal Harris with one of the more aggressive moves. He just made his start worse by hooking it so aggressively to the right, but, you know, they got away with it. There was no stress in the end. This is the view from Marjoram sitting on the roof, kind of like we're hanging in the back of the, uh, the tailgate. You can see Jesse Dixon getting squeezed right up to the wall out in front there. Cedars over to the left. He's going to try and pick up not one, but two Cedars racing cars. Great start out of Marjoram. Good under brakes there too. Squeezes Andrew Fisher oh. to the inside, and they all got through. That's... Work. It's actually pretty good driving from everyone to get through there side by side. Absolutely. So great start. He's having one of his uh, better weekends in only his second year in the youth so far, Adam Marjoram. Had a cracking weekend over at his home track in Perth in only uh, his second or third ever race, but he's doing a good job here this weekend. And these lead championship guys haven't really gained or lost anything so far this weekend, but there's still a few more laps to go on this one. And Adam Marjoram really aggressive over that first chicane there using you know, all the curb. You've got to be careful not to do that awkward double bounce like we saw Reese McNally do in one of the earlier races. But Royal Harris out in front, he's got that two or three car length gap, which you really look for. It means you don't have to worry about looking in your mirrors. You don't have to drive defensively. You just keep your vision forward and concentrate on your lap time. Turn your rear view mirror away and when you're out in front there, that's what you need to do. Maybe turn the radio up. Enjoy the drive. Try not to get too distracted by what's going on on all the balconies around the sunshine. So Marjoram with a lot of speed, but just can't seem to get around the guys ahead of him at the moment, including his uh, fellow West Aussie in Reese McNally, who's tucked up behind Hitch. Jesse Dixon, debut pole position for him this weekend. And McNally showing really good pace here. He's putting plenty of pressure on Jesse Dixon. All over the rear tailgate of Dixon, both in Holden Commodore Utes. So he'll be looking to uh, try and make a move at some stage soon. The order that they are in on the track right now is also the order that they're in for points for the weekend. So that will be your podium, Harris, Dixon and McNally, if it stays that way. But with uh, McNally showing this kind of speed, might be around Jesse Dixon's doors very shortly. Jesse has moved to Melbourne.
since, originally growing up in the Gold Coast and actually came back to his old uh, school to do a bit of a chat to the students at his old high school this week. We heard they'll all be trying to get a good run through the Turn 1 chicane to try, and McNally blocks again, so a little bit defensive into Turn 1, not overly so, there's nothing wrong with what he's doing, but he can see that car looming up in his mirrors into Turn 4 and doesn't want to get dive bombed. Passengers on the G-Link would have had a pretty good view of the action <laughs> going through the Turn 1, 2, 3 chicane. If you're a tourist on the Gold Coast and didn't know there was a race going on, it'd be pretty interesting. <laughs> Gee, these Utes are going pretty fast on the roads in Australia. <laughs> Also, uh, George Medici picked up the G-Link nickname for the weekend, which I think is pretty good. <laughs> also heard that Elliot Barber rode the tram into the track today. Apparently, a few people joking, it's the first time that he's ever caught public transport in his life. We're going to go off and have a short ad break. It's Roll Harris in control of this one. Is he going to stay there? We'll find out on the other side of this. Final race for the weekend. Service Paradise is where we're at. Penultimate round of the championship. The fight between Walton and Cedars is going to the last round if it stays the way it is at the moment. And this is the battle inside the top five with a very fast Adam Marjoram up there behind McNally. The cork in the bottle, I suppose you could say, is Jesse Dixon. The tyres start to wear out over the last race of the week. And there is our uh, runner-up in the series. And Alex, he will be at pains to try and stop being the runner-up again. Absolutely. You can see Jesse Dixon under a heap of pressure here. Now he's driving defensively into turn four. It looks like he's struggling with his tyres a little bit, but an awesome battle from second all the way back to eighth or ninth. It's just a massive train of V8 Utes snaking their way around this Gold Coast circuit. But on board here with Adam Marjoram in fourth place, trying as hard as he can to get past Reese McNally in front. Always awkward, unsighted over these curbs. You've got to Try and, try and still be aggressive, but not overuse the kerbs, which is very difficult when you're tucked up behind another car there. The super shocks have been given an absolute battering so far this weekend, but to be fair, they're actually holding up all right. We haven't seen too many suspension breakages or anything of the sort, considering the way the boys have been hitting the kerbs. It's uh, something to be pretty happy with. The super shocks are known to be very strong, and that's why a lot of the V8 supercar teams have even switched over to that product standing up to plenty of abuse with these V8 Utes this weekend. Oh, Marjoram now with problems behind him because he's got <laughs> race two winner Fisher all over his rear tailgate. So once again, where you go flying down this front straight. How's the history of this place? Been racing here since 1991. As we go uh, checking out a replay on board with Peter Burnett. Oh, just a graze, just a flesh wound. Plenty going on inside that cockpit there, but way too much curb. Hits the kerb on the wrong angle, which sends him straight out to the wall. You can see how much steering lock he's wound on to try and avoid that wall. He's only going to get a little bit of that. Oh, yeah, there goes another mirror for the weekend. Tell you what, Lee Nicolau in the background would have been thinking, please don't go in any harder. Because by that stage, you're fairly committed. We're halfway home, final race. And uh, we should keep an eye on Chris Walton there. He's trying to stay out of trouble here at the back of the pack. But he's not completely out of danger because he's got Ryan Hansford pushing hard to try and make up another position. You gotta remember, when you're fighting for a championship, um, you know, that's all that Chris Walton's thinking about, but no one else cares about his championship. <laughs> They're all just trying to make up a position. So, uh, difficult position to be in. It's not like fighting with one hand behind your back in a way. It is, it is. It's, very, it's the worst position to be in in the world when you, you've gotta keep pushing hard, but you wanna stay out of trouble as well. You can't have both best of both worlds. And for someone who's so aggressive like he is, it must be a really unusual mindset to bring into a race weekend. The man who's leading not only the Australian points uh, charge for the youth, but also he's leading the New Zealand point score as well. Looking to be only the second man ever after Chris Pitha, who's racing very typical cars this weekend, to win both the youth series in New Zealand and here in Australia. Yeah, clearly Chris is one of the best youth drivers around and drives these cars very, very well. Difficult to pick up these things and just drive fast as following Cedars around as Cedars. Whoa, that's the back end hangout. Nearly slaps the tyre fence at turn three. Got away with that one. Yeah, he's uh, right up on the wheel and pushing hard, that's for sure. It doesn't take much to lose the back end and slap that wall, as we've seen plenty of cars do across all categories this weekend. But this is a battle for the death for sure, and Cedars has got a championship on the line, so he's not backing off. It all stays the way it is right now. He'll only have a four point advantage. Well, he would have got four points back on Chris Walton, so still a long, long way to go with three ra uh, races in Sydney, but he's got a lot of work to do, and Chris Walton needs a lot of bad luck from here if he's going to drop this championship. David Cedars has got nothing to lose. He's just got to...
turn the mirrors to the sky, look forward and give it everything he's got. And if it, that means scraping walls and taking off mirrors, then so be it. But that's uh, what he needs to do for every race till the end of this championship. And as you said, just hope Chris Walton has a drama. Walton looks to the inside. He's getting a little impatient. At the last corner, 14, 15, the Castrol Ledge. Hairpin feed the power back onto the front straight with Roel Harris. Still a comfortable leader at the moment. Won his first race back here in 2005. Roel Harris, the year that the late Alan Simonson won the round in the V8 Utes. A long time ago now, Jack Ellsgood as well was on the podium back then. We go back down into turn one. We're nearly at the end of this weekend. This is, oh, Marjoram now wants to give the tyres a kiss. Yeah, he's having one of his best weekends of the year, so he's not going to back off, that's for sure. And he's giving it all he's got, trying to make up another spot. Interesting. Here we go, we've got a slow-mo replay of Peter Burnett. Plenty of understeer over that turn two curve, <laughs> winding on the lock. A harsh landing. Sideways on the exit. And the wall. There he goes. Just tap. Oh, that was nicely done. Hop, skip and a jump over the beach chicane. The Curbs taking a pounding this weekend. It's the final race for the V8 Utes. Field by Hog's Breath Cafe. Welcome back to the final race. Oh, the Jesus Racing Ute is in the fence. The race two winner, it's Andrew Fisher. He was lucky not to get picked up by anyone else there as well, Alex. Very lucky. The track's so narrow, we often see if one car goes in, the rest of them follow. Luckily, he's just gone into the tyre, so hopefully not too much damage. But it's wedged itself in there. Here we'll go, we'll see what happens. He's lost the rear on entry when he first started turning in, just lost the rear end and slid sideways straight into the fence. Won't be a lot of damage there. He's just got to safely get it out. That's uh, sometimes a bit difficult. You can get hooked onto the, uh, the big belts that go around these tyre fences. Looks like he's got that thing moving, so no safety car. We've really had the one safety car this weekend, and that was the one that ended the first uh, race of the weekend. No safety cars at all in Bathurst. Are we seeing as something of a changing of the guard, maybe, <laughs> in the VAUs? They're all starting to behave themselves. Oh, that's not a bad thing. We've seen some great racing so far this weekend. Plenty of close side-by-side -side racing, a little bit of contact, and that's what it's all about. We don't need to see this awkward contact. All it does is cost everyone a lot of money, and we end up watching 10 laps of safety cars every race. So, so far, so good. Two laps to go. Or David Seeders be thinking, what does he have to do to get into the championship lead going into the last round? He had that lead here last year, got turned around by Jesse Dixon in one of the races, and then caused or was part of that massive stack in the last race. He even got ping championship points as a result for the big one that we had here last year. And now he's going to have about a 60-point deficit to make up going into the last round. We're on board again with Adam Marjoram. It's great, what great onboard footage watching the cars fly over these curbs around this circuit. It's a, it's a tight rope these drivers have to walk. You know they've got to be super aggressive, but you want these cars to float nicely over the curbs and land nicely, not double bounce awkwardly, because that's not the quick way to get around the circuit. Marjoram driving very nicely in the Auto 1 Commodore Ute here. Using all the road oh, right oh, out oh, near oh, the oh. fence. I don't think, there, don't think there could be a mirror left on his right-hand side there because he used all the road then. Nothing a bit of a trip to Auto 1 can't fix. I'm sure they're stocking a few Holden mirrors. Royal Harris has done a great job out in front. He's really stretched that lead to one or two seconds. He's keeps it all under control. He'll keep it pretty comfortable to the end of the race. We've seen this lead pack, which was up to a train of eight or nine cars, slowly spread its way out into sort of two or three smaller groups. This pack here from Marjoram back to uh, Hansford, yeah. still pretty active. Plenty going on. Old tyres and they're starting to spread them out. Harris has said uh, over the years that he loves racing on these old tyres. And this looks like Dwarf, oh. the last lap of Cedars. Still pushing, caught the inside of the kerb and nearly fenced it. Once again, have we got anything left? Is there one last twist in the tail on the final lap? Well, we know Cedars isn't going to back off. And Chris Walton, you can see him fighting his natural tendencies. <laughs> you don't see many Ute races, Ute races in Australia where he isn't either at the front or moving towards the front. I've never seen a race where he's just sort of sat in this position comfortably. But he's, you can see he's got pace uh, right up behind David Cedars. Oh, he's killing him, but he's just comfortable where he is. He doesn't have massive amounts of pressure. Oh, Cedar's defensive. And yellow flags down here as well. So, And that would be because we've got Noel Edge, who's uh, quite slow at the exit of turn 11. Everyone seems to be able to navigate that one. Bit of a mobile chicane. 
I don't think Cedars needs to be too defensive because I've got the feeling Chris Walton's happy sitting right behind him. If he gets in front of him, you know exactly what will be going through Cedars' head. <laughs> won't, don't you? Especially on the last lap. Maybe a little tap tap. But so we're out of the last corner and it's going to be Royal Harris. So every round this year, the bloke who wins race one goes on to win race three. That could be an omen for the last race of the championship. Lucky seven for Royal Harris at home on the Gold Coast. And it's another round win here as well, just like he did back in 2011 when he got the clean sweep. He has been superior since making that move over to Matt Stone Racing. Second round win for him for the year as well, just like we see Cedars and also Chris Walton uh, taking two wins so far this year. And Jesse Dixon, his best performance, you have to say, so far in his young career, which is fitting too because it's 10 years since the passing of his dad uh, at this round and at home as well. So nice work for Jesse Dixon. Adam Marjoram fourth, did a good job. Chris Walton stayed out of trouble, just like he had to do. And Craig Dontis missed qualifying, but did a good job to be 10th in the final race. And, well, the round points for the weekend, Roll Harris takes it out by just the one point. Cedars also just missing out on a podium. Well, Roll, you always make an impact, and the start of that one was no different. No, I was, um, I was sitting on the, more, the right amount of revs, and then uh, probably about a second before the lights went out, I was probably 700 more than I should have been, so got a big bit of wheel spin, had to back off it, and I just turned right to try and cover, but Jesse was already there, and I thought I'd better stop turning right at some stage before I put him in the fence, so he's driven well all weekend. I'm uh, pretty happy for him to be up here on the podium. So happy to win at home. It's a great feeling. The championship's a long shot, but... Um, you know, I'll just keep winning races and see what happens. Mathematically, I'm sure it's possible, but, you know, in reality, it's not going to happen. So, you know, we've accepted that and we'll move on and hopefully we'll come back next year and, uh, and uh, go for three. The big mover in the Armour All point score is Jesse Dixon. He jumps up to third. Harris is flying up the points, but like he says, it's probably a bit too late for a championship charge. And, well, Chris Walton, he's in the box seat. Well, Chris, you've retained the championship lead and any time you can do that on this punishing circuit, it's a job well done. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it would have been great to come here and sort of take the round out. We've got the car to do it, but championship-wise, we, we sort of couldn't put ourselves in that position. So, um, no, car's straight. We stayed no penalties this time, which is great. So, um, yeah, we've still got a good, nice, nice lead, so um, we'll just see how we go next round. As a racer, it must be killing you to, to, to play the safe game in a way. It is. It hurts. You just want to go there and have a go and can't do it, you know. We, we've just got to collect points. We can't risk it. You know, as soon as we touch another car, something's going to happen. So um, we go out there. We're sort of playing the game at the moment. Three races to go. Um, yeah, let's see if we can do the same thing again. To the awards, and it's the DBA Heartbreaker Award. It goes to Jared McLeod, who went flying through race two, picking up 11 spots and taking the money as well. Nice work, Jared. Phil Woodbury is leading the Rookie of the Year honours, and despite having that nasty crash in race one and missing out races two and three, he takes out the uh, Rookie of the Year honours so far and looking good to wrap it up. Here's the podium. Congratulations to Ryle Harris. Chris Walton's streak of five in a row comes to an end. Dixon on the podium as well. And that's back-to-back -back podiums for Rhys McNally. The final round of the championship, it's on its way. We go racing around Sydney Olympic Park, a place with plenty of history, and we'll be crowning a champion for 2014. Thanks to Alex Davison for joining me. This has been the V8 Utes, fueled by Hogsbreath Cafe. Can't wait for the final round.